I'm Laura London, and this is a special video edition of Speaking of Jung. Joining us today for episode 117 is Jungian scholar and professor, Dr. Roderick Main at the University of Essex in England. He holds a master's degree in classics from the University of Oxford and earned a PhD in religious studies from Lancaster University, where his thesis was on synchronicity as a form of spiritual experience. In 1997, he joined the Department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytic Studies at the University of Essex as a visiting research fellow and was appointed as a lecturer in 2000. His many roles in the department include course lead for the Master of Arts in Jungian and Post-Jungian Studies from 2002 to 2009 and department head from 2008 to 2012. Currently, he is the director of the Center for Myth Studies. His teaching and research focus on the work of C.G. Jung, especially in relation to religion, mythology, literature, and society. His publications have engaged in particular with Jung's concept of synchronicity. He is the author of The Rupture of Time, Synchronicity and Jung's Critique of Modern Western Culture, Revelations of Chance, Synchronicity as Spiritual Experience, and Breaking the Spell of Disenchantment, Mystery, Meaning, and Metaphysics in the Work of C.G. Jung. He is also editor of the volumes Jung on Synchronicity and the Paranormal, part of the Encountering Jung series from Princeton University Press, and a new edition of The Interpretation of Nature and the Psyche, the work of Carl Jung and Wolfgang Pauli in which Dr. Main presents the original essays with a brand new introduction and commentary. From 2016 to 2018, Dr. Main served as principal investigator on an Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project titled One World, Logical and Ethical Implications of Holism, which resulted in two books co-edited with Christian McMillan and David Henderson. Holism, Possibilities and Problems, and Jung, Deleuze, and the Problematic Whole. In October of 2021, Dr. Main delivered the Zurich Lecture Series at the International School of Analytical Psychology, known as ISAP Zurich, and this June will be presenting the Hermeneutics of Exceptional Experiences at the Perry Center Conference at the Edges of Consciousness. Science and Anomalous Experiences, held June 6th through the 13th in Perry, Italy. Please visit our website, speakingofyoung.com, where, where you will find links to everything in the show notes. This video interview is being recorded on Wednesday, January 11th, 2023, through the magic of StreamYard. Professor Main, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Laura, for the invitation. So let's start at the beginning. Um, in the preface to your latest book, you mentioned that you dropped out of Oxford after your first year to go live in Glastonbury, where you, quote, explored magic and wrote poetry. Tell us about that. Yes, um, I did. Um, I did eventually return. I mentioned that too. Yeah, right. For years, but uh, I, I, when when I started studying at, at Oxford, I, I'd been interested for some time in uh, sort of the work of Nietzsche and uh, and other sort of thinkers on on the sort of uh, margins of the academic world, as it were. And I, I found the, the the sort of environment that I was in in, in Oxford, although it was tremendously stimulating in many ways intellectually also um, not very um, not really answering to my sort of deeper my, my deeper sort of uh, desires to to know and to experience and so on so uh, so I, I became interested in in well in, in magic in in um, esoteric thought in and, and so on and uh, uh, and I uh, yeah, I just came to the decision that that I, I would I would sort of drop out of, of conventional education mm -hmm. and go to law on my own. So I so I went to 
Glastonbury, um, taking a sort of suitcase of relevant books, and uh, and uh, and sort of set myself up there and and tried to uh, to sort of explore things in in a more independent way. Uh, obviously, you know, it, I, it, things didn't go quite as uh, 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 smoothly as I hoped they might, and uh, I had some extraordinarily interesting experiences, but I didn't. Uh, uh, I, I didn't really accomplish what I thought I, I wanted to. So um, after a, a couple of years of exploring there and traveling around and doing other various things, I, I eventually um, sort of returned to Oxford. They sort of kept the place open for me and I eventually returned mm -hmm. and uh, completed my degree. Um, although I, you know, I'd, I'd initiated a, an interest in, in a whole range of areas uh, I mean, magic was just part of it. I was also interested in, in mysticism of various kinds, um, in particular, uh, Kabbalah and Sufism and, uh, uh, and uh, eventually Krishna Mercy's thought um, and so on. And uh, Jung's thought, um, uh, you, you're pleased to know, was also a major part of, of, of this or became, became so. I became very interested in that. And I sort of had sort of developed all these interests, but I also... Um, sort of had a, um, acquired a more uh, sort of a sense that I could integrate or a, a wish to integrate those interests with also um, a sort of working in a more sort of academic way as well. So I, I, so I sort of returned and completed my degree in classics and uh, um, yeah and, and uh, sort of towards the end of my, 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 my time there I, I you know I sort of again sort of swung off into a, a rather alternative direction and it was uh, and I, I became interested in, in psychical research and uh, involved myself in that for a while and uh, and, and, and did a, a few other things and eventually became uh, you know in order to pursue my uh, some more academic sort of side of my being I sort of decided I would go and, and try and study for a, for a PhD which I eventually did at uh, Lancaster University. Mm -hmm. so it, was a, it was a sort of a, a bit of a, an unusual way of, uh, of getting getting to that point, but, uh, but that, that's, that's what I was doing. Well, it got my attention because when I started at the university, I got sick, not, not with a serious illness, but sick enough where I wanted to take a, a, we were on quarters, not semesters. And I took a semester off and I, I spent it um, kind of healing. And a lot of kind of strange, interesting things happened. And then I wanted to make up that quarter. So I went the summer quarter and I took a course on transpersonal psychology. And I do believe that was my first introduction to Jung. Wow. Uh, so then I, I was kind of renewed and recharged by that course and knew kind of what to pursue from that. So I appreciated that. So what I'm interested in about your work is with all of your interests, you still decided to pursue a career as an academic. And but you're you're a very interesting academic because you teach and research Jungian topics, um, which don't always sit very comfortably, you know, in an academic context. And mm -hmm. you, I've heard you say that you sort of see yourself as holding the two things together. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'd like to try and try and do. Um, I was very fortunate, I have to say, I mean, that I, I was work, uh, I did my PhD, as I said, at Lancaster University, and I did a little bit of teaching there. Um, there was a, a, a my, my supervisor, Adrian Cunningham, taught on, on Jung. And uh, he, um, the, so he, he sort of gave me some teaching to do on, and I taught on transpersonal psychology, some Jungian stuff, and also uh, on, on an undergraduate program again, some some Jungian stuff. Um, so, so that was was a good sort of introduction to academic teaching. And then, um, when they were opening, starting the uh, the Centre for Psychoanalytic Studies, as it then was at the University of Essex, mm -hmm. um, I. Uh, I became aware of this through through Adrian, and uh, and uh, I went down and I was I was 
I went there initially as a, a visiting research fellow, a sort of non-stipendiary visiting research fellow, and, and sort of joined um, the, 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 the teaching staff there just as um, they were setting up the, uh, a master's in, in Jungian and post-Jungian studies. Mm. Andrew Samuels and Reynolds mm. Papadopoulos were, were setting this up. And uh, so I joined them and, and, and taught on that from the first uh, year of its presentation in 1998 uh, to, uh, you know, it's still a program that's still going. This is the, the MA Jungian and Post-Jungian Studies. Um, so I was very lucky to get into uh, in teaching something where I could sort of, um, uh, you know, find an outlet for my range of interests. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, Jung is a, he's a fantastic figure to to teach um, for the reason that he had he had a finger in every pie in the yeah. culture. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he, and you can be, <laughs> you, if you've got a, a breadth of interest, you can you can uh, be teaching about sort of science, physics one day, his interests in in religion the next day, or literature, or or psychotherapy, or you know, it's uh, very wide ranging and uh, and uh, and it also accommodates, of course, because of Jung's range of interests mm. or my interest in in uh, sort of psychical research and um sort of parapsychological experiences and synchronicity and uh, and uh, esotericism and mysticism and so on so mm-hmm. it was uh, it was very fortunate to be able to do that um and you know i'm i'm, I'm, I'm still there <laughs> well you say that you were you know you were fortunate uh to be able to do that is uh is that not kind of accepted everywhere, would you say, that those topics, those areas of interest in research? Well, accepted everywhere, how do you mean? The, the... In, in, in the academic world, well, being interested well, they, yeah. in them. Yeah. To be interested in them, uh, yes. I, I mean, you, you, in, in, in religious studies, you can, you know, you can study uh, Jung, for example, as, as a, a theorist who's, who's contributed a lot to the field, and I've, I've done that. And uh, but uh, but the, there are not many places where you can actually study Jung's work academically or, right. or teach academically. There have not been. I mm-hmm. mean, there are a few more now than there were then. But but uh, uh, but there are not many. And uh, and to do it in the sort of concentrated way that I've been able to do it, and also to you know be able to research it, uh, I think is uh, uh, you know I don't think there are many places where one would be able to do that. Right. But, uh, I do see it as as, as quite fortunate. Of course, you know the, there are different ways of of studying as well, and different ways of of writing and teaching. And the, um, I, I one could do it in a, from a purely sort of academic way, just all about Jung, in the sense that you just use mm. um, standard ways of researching and, and and thinking and writing about uh, Jung. And of course, I do that. I I try to make my work as scholarly as as possible. Um, and as you know, and as, as as credible as possible at a scholar. Yes, and it is. I have but to there, say, but there are, you know, there's also a sense that Jung is writing about something, which um, is not itself very, very acceptable to most academic environments. Actually, right. Um, the, the 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 ideas, the 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 sort of underlying assumptions that he has, um, a sort of the implicit metaphysics that he's working with is not very in harmony with with the sort of mainstream assumptions of academia, um, which is part of the reason why I found the environment uh, in Oxford difficult. You know, and, and you know, I'm not blaming Oxford there. I mean, I think this is, I mean, well, it's partly an image of my image of Oxford rather than how it might have been in reality. I don't know, but uh, uh, but but academic environments tend to. Um, uh, not to take too seriously the thoughts of interests that, that Jung had. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, you know assumption that these are sort of far out um, uh, areas that, that don't really warrant serious investigation or, or consideration and so on. And there might be some historical interest, um, but not as something that, that could be um, relevant to us now. Um, well, from from where I sit, I'm seeing that they uh, are being studied more, and they are relevant as more and more people come out and talk about their experiences. Right. And one of my uh, problems with pretty much every field 
uh, except psychology, is that they tend to ignore the human psyche and the existence of the unconscious. Yeah. And so the, it, it's a mess. Yeah. But I would like to, uh, as I pointed out in the introduction, your thesis at the University of Lancaster was on synchronicity as a form of spiritual experience. And what I'm wondering is how back then were you, did you become so interested in that, that you decided to write your thesis about that? Um, well, it was, I suppose, I, I've become interested in synchronicity as a, as a, as a, as a, a form of experience, as an experience. And, uh, and the, and to, to my mind, it seems to uh, suggest um, the, the experiences seem to have this, this numinosity about them. They, they, um, they seem to operate in ways that transgress how you think, how we're sort of acculturated to think that, that, uh, that events occur and, and so on. Um, and they, they often seem to speak symbolically of, of um, uh, rather like dreams of, of, of aspects of experience um, that, that, uh, that don't, uh, you know, that, 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 that are a, a, a bit elusive and, and um, uh, but, but also quite gripping and sometimes transformative. Um, so they have, uh, the experiences have this sort of uh, spiritual aspect to, to them, which has not been, or had not been um, so much studied, you know, I mean, in, in, in what's in the, the writings that I'd encountered so far. I mean, there, there had been, been some, I mean, there was a fantastic um, book written by somebody who also studied actually at uh, Lancaster University with Adrian Cunningham um, uh, a, a number of years before I started. This was um, uh, Robert Aziz, Canadian uh, psychotherapist and scholar. Um, he wrote a book called um, C.G. Jung's Psychology of Religion and Synchronicity. It's a fantastic book, actually, and that was a, a bit of a, an inspiration. It's why why I went and looked to study at uh, Lancaster. Um, so there had been been works like that, and uh, I was suppose I was sort of following um, on a track that uh, that Robert Aziz had, had set there. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I was interested in looking at, um, at 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 I suppose contemporary experiences, and or, or so so. In, in my thesis, I analyzed a, um, a sort of a, a set of experiences um, by a, a chess player, um, actually a former British uh, chess champion, uh, James Plaskett, who had started having strange coincidences and meticulously recorded them and, uh, uh, and found that all sorts of themes emerged and, and the more he recorded them, the more he seemed to have these experiences and threat and lots of interconnections amongst them. And he didn't know quite what to do with this material and somehow it, it came my way. And uh, and I, I thought I would use this with his permission uh, as a as material that I would study in my PhD, which I did. And I, and I sort of analysed it using a methodology that was a bit like the one that Jung uses in, in psychology and alchemy when he's studying Wolfgang's Paul, Wolf, Wolfgang Pauli's series of dreams, using the various experiences as a sort of uh, as a series of experiences as a context for one another, and and finding themes amongst them and so on. So I analysed his his material in that way and and found that it you know that it sort of seemed to point in 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 for me anyway in in in, in spiritual directions and uh, and that was. Uh, uh, yeah, so that was uh, a major part of it, and another part of the the thesis was to look at in in, in quite a lot of detail at the synchronistic aspects of the the I Ching, the mm -hmm. Chinese Oracle of Change, um, which I did, uh, and uh, and and also to look at um, at various spiritual concepts that had been, that, that existed in in, in I, I was focusing mainly on sort of Western traditions, but. Uh, uh, but how they, how synchronicity had affinities with these concepts. So I looked at the concept of numinosity, the concept of the miraculous, of um, transcendence and immanence and uh, 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 revelation and transformation and so on, and, and uh, sort of explored how 
synchronistic, synchronistic experiences were, were were similar in many ways to these um, these sort of traditional uh, religious concepts. So, is that thesis uh, was it the uh, impetus for your 2007 book, Revelations of Chance: Synchronicity as Spiritual Experience? Yes, it was. It was more than the impetus for it. It was mostly was it. <laughs> um, and, and that's the one with the praying mantis on the cover. Right. right yes. Yeah. 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 Tell Tell us a little bit about why you put that gigantic. It's so striking. I love that book cover. The praying mantis yeah. on the cover of that book. Well, um, interestingly, um, I, I didn't decide to do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, it was the publisher's decision. Um, they, uh, uh, pr uh, SUNY Press, uh, State University of New York Press, mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, I mean, it, the reason they put it there, one of the reasons they put it there was because uh, the, the opening of the book is an account, a story yeah. um, about a praying mantis that, that, that's given by Adolf Portman. Um, or recounted all that at all Portman that he when he was giving a lecture at, at Terranos, he was about to mention the 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 um, the, the praying mantis in his lecture, Gottes and and Betelin, I think it is in in, in German, the the uh, God worshipper or whatever it is. Um, and just as he was about to mention this in his lecture, an insect flew in through the window uh, and landed on the the lectern behind him. In front of the light that was on, that was sort of illuminating his papers, so that the light shining on the praying mantis cast on the wall behind him this huge sort of image of a of, of, of this insect. So I started the the, the book with with that anecdote, and uh, and uh, the publishers obviously picked up that image from that, and they mm. they produced that they they, they selected that. Uh, uh, image of the the, the praying mantis, which, which I think is you know they, they did a really nice job actually just a simple clean image in the middle of yeah. the, the book I, yes. I, I really like it yes but, but at that time I had I'd never um, I'd never seen a praying mantis actually in, mm. in real life because they, they don't uh, we don't get them in the UK um, I don't think um, and uh, but shortly after the book came out I, I was in Japan with my, with with my wife and family and uh, uh, and uh, we visited a, a shrine in um, uh, near near where my my wife's uh, family lives in in Shiga, uh, it's a Mikamiyama shrine, and uh, uh, and we were I was sort of wandering around apart from them in the in the shrine and the, my wife, her mother, and my two children and they they called me over. I went over and uh, and there was a praying mantis sort of sort of among them that, and I, I sort of went over and joined them and and was obviously fascinated by this insect which I was seeing for the first time they're pretty big aren't they and, uh, yes and as I was as I was um, we, we were sort of all watching this praying mantis very gingerly sort of walked over towards directly towards me when I came mm. over and joined them and uh, and then got to the my shoe and then suddenly very quickly scuttled up my trouser leg. And up my, um, not not up it, but uh, on the outside, I have to. Okay. Because <laughs> they're quite deadly. Um, and uh, yes. they, um, uh, and uh, so I went, went up onto, onto my chest and just sort of came to a sort of rest mm. over my, on, you know, my heart, really. And uh, and, and sort of was, was sort of staring staring up at me. Um, and, uh, you know, so I sort of uh, stared back uh, in uh, somewhat uh, Anxious, actually, because uh, they've they sure. they have a reputation for for um, attacking things larger than themselves. Yes, <laughs> as an insect, and uh, um, you know, and uh, it, anyway, eventually, I sort of, I didn't, I rather, I didn't, I eventually, I, it, I it, it removed it, and uh, um, removed uh, it. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was very, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a striking experience actually, because you know, I've not seen one of these things before, and then. Right. I just published this this book which had the image on and uh, and then it, it sort of uh, um, so you know I mean I consider that you know an interesting synchronicity that I one of my, my own more interesting synchronicities actually you know uh, and uh, well it yeah. was similar to the one you recount in the book with the professor uh, 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 giving the lecture so yeah. let's use that as an example yeah. uh, how would you 
I don't know. I don't want to use the word explain. No. Uh, I don't want to say, how would you explain that? But what do you, in this limited amount of time that we have, what would you say about the, those two examples and synchronicity? What's, what's really to you going on there? Mm. Well, uh, I mean, it's, it's very, it's, it's the thing that interests me most, actually, to be honest about them, is um, the, uh, that they, experiences such as that, they, they, they don't seem to be explicable in, in sort of normal cause and effect terms, right. with something going on that is, is quite sort of um, other, and it's very difficult to say what it is, you can speculate about, you know, about what it, what it might be, but um, there's some sort of, uh, expression of meaning within that that, that 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 sort of correlation of a of a psychic event and a physical event the sort mm -hmm. of the the, the uh, portman thinking about the the um the the praying mantis about to talk about it then it appearing in reality and it behaving in that particular way and casting that image in my case uh it, you know this image being on my mind because of having the published the book and then yeah and and then, um, and then this this event happening. There's some strange sort of um, uh, correlation. So, so the, the, the fact that it, it doesn't seem like it ought to happen um, right. and it grips you. Then, uh, but the thing that interests me most is what is the meaning of the experience. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, you know, and then you then you you sort of try and uh, think about. I mean, there there, there are. Possible, I mean, all sorts of ways one could go with that, and uh, but it, 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 you know, it, I mean, Jung, Jung talks about uh, about the the the, the uh, uh, meaning in terms of archetypes and uh, and and, and the, uh, the different. In fact, one of the one of the the things that I most value about Robert Azizi's work, and which I've used uh, in my, in my own work, is that he he identified different levels of meaning in these mm -hmm. sorts of experiences. Um, the first level being just the sort of basic paralleling, you know, that they that the, the the thing that you're thinking and the thing that happens in physical reality happen to be happen to mean more or less the same thing. In this case, you know, the, to do the praying mantis. Um, the second level of meaning that he talks about is uh, what he calls the sort of numinous meaning, sort of this sort of emotional, affective charge, and non-rational um, dimension of meaning that, that that grips you and makes you feel that there is something, perhaps spiritual or something more significant going on in the experience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then there's uh, the possible meaning that it might have for you. Third level meaning that it might have for you personally, you know, and we don't know in. in Portman's case, what that might have been. In my own case, to be honest, I, I I'm not entirely sure what what it what it meant personally. It, it certainly, um, uh, I mean, what one has to think about the the sort of symbolism of it, um, and uh, and perhaps why I haven't thought too much about it is that the symbolism of the the, the praying mantis is is a little bit disturbing actually, because um, uh, the praying mantis, uh, I mean, it means. It, well, there's, there's two sort of levels, I suppose, two two main aspects of its symbolism, as far as I can see. One is where it's uh, it's, it's quite positive. It's a, a sort of deity in in certain cultures, right. um, in in in, uh, in certain um, cultures in Africa, like the the Koe and the San, so on. It's a, a sort of uh, um, a trickster kind of deity, um, and and also has. Um, uh, characteristics in in other cultures of, of bit, a bit like a sort of Hermes figure, where it sort of guides travelers or or um, guides people to the underworld, even in, in Egyptian mythology and 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 so on. So it's got this sort of Hermes Thoth kind of characteristic about it as well. Uh, this is all very interesting and positive, and cor correlates to to um, uh, synchronicity. Um, and, and perhaps another strong association for me, uh, uh, which I should mention, is that um, what it meant for me, it, it did come to symbolise synchronicity for me, not just because it was mm. on the cover of my book on synchronicity, but because there was um, uh, a couple of previous people who'd had 
synchronicities with um, uh, mantises, praying mantises, had, had sort of, you know, relayed them in books. One was um, Joseph Campbell, who relates that when he was writing about the praying mantis, one appeared on his window ledge in a, a skyscraper somewhere in New York. Um, and another is uh, Lorenz van der Post, who wrote a book called A Mantis Carol, uh, which in which the, the image of the, um, the the praying mantis was very central to his sort of un, unraveling or uncovering of a story about uh, um, a, uh, um, a, a a San a member of the San tribe or the, uh, of the uh, Bushmen as he as he called them. Um, so so it was a so it's a, it had been uh, there had been synchronicities written about in at least yeah. three cases that I knew so it kind of symbolized that for me that's that's one aspect of its personal meaning um then there's this and that all associates well with the the sort of Thoth Hermes deity kind of aspect mm. but there was another aspect of it which is um is that um one of the things that's known about mantises is that after they've um the female mantis after it's um had uh, uh intercourse it, it's uh, it's it not um, infrequently um promptly beheads the male and and devours it um the head and the rest of the male so, so it's a sort of you know sexual cannibalism uh, and uh so uh and and indeed in some uh, uh yeah, cultures you know there there, is, there are associations of the mantis with female authority and so on probably for, for this kind of reason um so, so there may be you know another aspect of it there and i, I you know uh, so maybe that's why I haven't explored the personal significance of that too mm. much. I don't know. Um, no, and uh, I just want to add that Whitley Strieber has also mentioned the praying mantis in relation uh, yeah. uh, or in conjunction uh, or in association with uh, the gray visitors. Yeah. 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 Right, yeah. So, yeah. You, so it's meaning that, and that's the, 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 you know, so there's the personal meaning and then the, just to, uh, kind of conclude really that as he also talks about what he calls a, a fourth archetypal or objective level of meaning, which yeah. is what the, the, the symbol in the experience means, sort of in itself, not necessarily for the experiencer, but just as mm -hmm. a sort of uh, an expression of, of of the collective unconscious in in, in or an expression in the world, you know. So, so at certain times, certain images, uh, symbols may arise and they may be. <clears throat> We may be carried by an individual and be relevant to them, but they also may have a, a wider um, significance culturally or socially or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, I was just going to say you mentioned meaning as the connecting factor in synchronicity. Um, you also wrote a paper uh, titled Putting the Zin Back into Synchronicity, and you explain that the word Zin, which is spelled capital S I N N, uh, is pronounced as though the S were a Z and is the German word for meaning, and that it appears in the phrase, which I'm not going to try to pronounce, um, which means meaningful coincidence, mm -hmm. uh, which is Jung's most succinct definition for synchronicity. So, meaning is something that sometimes gets overlooked. Uh, when people are discussing synchronicity, mm. yeah, the, I mean, there's a there's a sort of because that's so, sometimes such striking experiences, one can get just uh, attracted yeah. by the the sheer, you know, e extraordinariness of them and excited by that, or right. one can consider get tangled up with the question of you know could this happen by chance or couldn't it and so on and that's and that. but the, to my to my mind the really interesting thing is the is the meaning you know what is it it's like a it's like a dream. I mean, you could you could be interested in the the you know the vividness of your dreams or the colours in your dreams or whatever. Mm. But, uh, but what does the dream actually mean is probably yeah. the what the more important question. Mm -hmm. But before you published Revelations of Chance, which is the book with the praying mantis on the cover, a few years prior to that, you published a book titled The Rupture of Time: Synchronicity and Jung's Critique of Modern Western Culture. Yeah. And you say that the book aimed to clarify what Jung really meant by synchronicity and mm -hmm. why the idea was so important to him. So what did you discover uh, as the reason to why synchronicity had become so important to him? 
Um, well, I think because uh, I, th I, th I think I think he, and this is, is this also also sort of leads on to my my recent book in in a sense. And I think Jung was concerned, uh, you know, that uh, that our culture was was sort of dominated by a, a sort of mm. one-sided intellectualism, rationalism, uh, an overemphasis on 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 those kinds of ways of of thinking and organizing um society and, and, and culture and uh uh and was turning its back on or, or just turning away from whole ranges of experience that that the yeah. that, that people have and things that occur and uh, uh and was sort of denying their reality um, sort of intuitive, emotional, imaginative ways of of, of relating and understanding, and uh, and I think he he saw that synchronicity or thought that synchronicity was an indication of um, another way in which um, events organise themselves in in uh, in reality, so that everything is not explicable just in terms of causes and effects and and uh, uh, and. And, and so on, but there is this this other factor uh, that 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 is that is part of reality. Um, in other way, words, um, the, the sort of scientific rationalism, which is what he was so concerned about, um, mm -hmm. tends to strip the idea of meaning out of uh, oh, yeah. its picture of the universe and to consider it, and indeed, just you know, to, it's also predominantly. A, a sort of uh, materialistic or physicalist sort of outlook, which tends to uh, view reality as being fundamentally material, fundamentally physical, um, and to have um, um, uh, had to, to have uh, uh, you know no sort of intrinsic meaning, and therefore um, you know. If there is, if we experience meaning, this is just something that we sort of make up and project onto the world in order right. to make us feel cosier in a, yeah. in a, yeah. a fundamentally sort of meaningless, vast and and, and sort of uh, indifferent universe. Um, and I, uh, you know, I think Jung, Jung's concept of synchronicity was was important to him because it was a way of challenging that notion, as it were, and uh, and reintroducing notion of of meaning as a, a sort of fundamental constituent of of reality and something that is really a feature mm. of of reality not just something that we're making up and that isn't really a part of of, of reality um mm -hmm. so that was part of it there was um there was also the the sense that and, and this is all part and parcel really of the same thing that it's it's uh it's a reintegrative concept um the the way in which uh he was concerned with the, the split between between certain kinds of rational modes of thinking and and, and emotional dimensions of experience um, the split between matter and material um, investigation and psychological investigation um, and I, uh, he was very concerned with the split between science and religion because he had dual commitments himself to both yeah and uh, and he, he was uh, a profoundly holistic thinker, uh, mm -hmm. and I think he wanted to bring these things together. And uh, synchronicity was one mm -hmm. that helped him to do that. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the reasons. Yeah, and you said that I just want to check the time here. Um, you well, I do. I for some reason want to mention this. So I'm always interested in where book titles come from, and that phrase, "the rupture mm -hmm. of time," appears in Eliade's interview with Jung at the 1952 Eranos conference, mm -hmm. and that is published in the book C.G. Jung Speaking. It was Eliade's uh, interview for Combat, and. Uh, Jung said, recently, I have put a great deal of study into synchronicity, briefly, the rupture of time. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, it, and that's where you got that title from? Oh, that's exactly where I got it from. Yeah, I love the title. It's the only time Jung writes about synchronicity in exactly that way. Yeah. It was it was too good not to use. Um, so, uh, and in a sense, it's slightly flavoured by Eliada, because Eliada is the one who, who talks a lot about rupturing time and history and mm -hmm. so on. There's an Eliadian flavor to it. 
Um, mm. But it does also it does also capture, I think, what what Jung was was interested in this sense of um, the moment where, because in syn these synchronistic experiences, it's as though the something beyond time burst into time. Mm. Uh, 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 I think it was uh, one of Jung's um, one of the first of Jung's uh, sort of followers, as it were, who uh, who wrote a lot about synchronicity, Marie Louise von Franz, yeah. who, who uh, wrote a lot about um, the synchronicity as the the sort of um, uh, what is it, the, the fenestra aeternitatis, the the window into eternity, as as, as providing a sort of a, a you know a point where where the time bound world penetrates into a timeless world. Mm. Experiences have that quality of being that you know they're, they're in time. They happen in in our experience, but they within them there seems to be something that is outside time, something um, you know, mm. a, a little flavor of eternity, if you like. Yeah. So before we get to the new book, uh, I just would like to mention that you have a chapter in the Pauli Jung conjecture, which mm. has been mentioned on on this mm. podcast many times. I was edited by co-edited by uh, Harold Ottman Spocker, who was. My guest in this previous uh, in the previous episode, episode one hundred sixteen, mm. and your chapter is titled "Synchronicity and the Problem of Meaning in Science." Mm -hmm. uh, so I would just like to tell the listeners that uh, that Dr. Main does have a chapter in that book. There will be a link to it in the show notes, and uh, if it, unless you want to say something about that, I would like to talk about your latest book, which was the subject of uh, the Zurich Lecture Series, which is an annual lecture series at the uh, in International School of Analytical Psychology in Zurich, which is known as ISAP Zurich. And you presented the lecture series back in 2021. And this episode here today has been a long time in the making because I had asked you back then uh, to do an episode with me about it, and you wanted to wait until the book came out. So Chiron published the book last year, and so it is out and it is available, and it is titled Breaking the Spell of Disenchantment. But you earlier, because I you've done some uh, interviews about it, you earlier referred to the subtitle as the counter magic of individuation. Do you remember that? So yeah. the the title of the book changed a little bit. So I, I would love for you to tell us all about that because it is, the title's fascinating, the book is fascinating, the subject matter of disenchantment is not something we hear that often. So where would you like to start? Well, I'll start with the title then. I mean, the, okay. the, the lectures actually I called The Undoing of Disenchantment. Yeah. Um, uh, but then I thought, um, I, I rather like the idea of, um, of, of of, instead of undoing, breaking the spell, because that mm. highlights that um, that uh, disenchantment, which itself is supposed to be about breaking the spell. I mean, disenchantment comes from the the um, the, the, the sort of the German word that was used by Max Weber um, uh, and 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 Zauberung, the sort of um, uh, dis uh, uh, demagification. I suppose it means literally um, the, the elimination of magic. Um, but uh, and but but it, rather than just um, you know disenchantment being the, the sort of the end point, I'm I'm, I'm suggesting that uh, with the type that by the title breaking the spell of disenchantment, the disenchantment itself is a spell yeah. that, that that's kind of fascinated and gripped our culture and put it in us, mm. um, uh, believing that that is the the the, the sort of uh, you know the reality that this sort of disenchanted state. Is in some way the natural state. The um, the Canadian um, uh, thinker whom I I I cite in some of my work, um, Charles Taylor, has a, a marvelous uh, uh, expression which he calls uh, the sort of traction stories, um, which is where um, the sort of belief that by or this sort of view that um, that modern um, sort of disenchanted culture, as it were. Um, sees through critiques all our former illusions, our former religious illusions, and gets strips them away and leaves mm -hmm. us in this disenchanted state. And that's yeah. you know, and, and that's the reality that's left over once you subtract the illusions. Um, and 
Uh, and what I wanted to say is that that subtracted state is not um, the the sort of you know the reality, but in itself is another fascination, another spell mm. that that, uh, that 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 modern culture, in some of its aspects, has has allowed itself to get into the grip of. Yeah. So, so, um, so, so, uh, yeah. So that's really what uh, what I'm what the, the the book is partly doing. Really, is saying that uh, that Jung um, he, he developed his views on individuation and his views his psychology in general precisely at the time when Max Weber, um, who is the sort of person who wrote about uh, who, who made the, the term the disenchantment of the world famous. Um, he wrote about it in in a, a lecture that he gave in 1917 um, at Science as a Vocation, and uh, uh, and this is just at the time when Jung is is sort of beginning to develop his ideas of individuation, and and Weber was characterising the you know a spirit if you like that was very prevalent in in Western academic and intellectual and general culture at, at the time. Um, uh, a, a, this sort of spirit that you that you could and you can extrapolate from what he says how he what he thought about it and, and some of the things that he thought were that it was you know it was highly intellectual highly rationalistic in the same kinds of ways that Jung talks about but also that it implied um, that there was no fundamental mystery in mm. in reality that um, that everything could be in principle explained by by empiricism and reason. Um, mm. uh, Second, that, that that science, which was our dominant way of acquiring knowledge, empiricism and reason, that these these could establish what the facts were, um, but they couldn't establish values or meanings. Yeah. Science can tell us nothing about meaning, um, so so um, so that's another implication of this idea of disenchantment. And a third implication is that um, there is no, um, you know, there's no. Uh, spiritual or divine or other metaphysical reality beyond the sort of in, what the reality that is given empirically that we experience empirically that, that you can that you can kind of connect to or relate to in any um, meaningful way that also seems to be uh, an implication of what uh, Weber is, is, is saying in his lecture um, and that sort of spirit that general spirit of you know no, no there's no re real sacred reality there's no Sort of inherent meaning. There's no real mystery. This seemed to be characterise a lot of the the intellectual world of Jung's time, in which he was working and and sort of doing his own work. And I, and I think he was profoundly affected by that. Yeah. And worked against it. You know. He and he developed his his thoughts. Um, and he he didn't use the term disenchantment, and he didn't mm -hmm. he didn't as a concept. I don't think he ever used the term, but he. But he used analogous terms like desacralization or or um, uh, despiritualization and so on. So he was he was he had the same sort of perceptions as uh, of, of Weber of, of what was going on in the culture in a large part of the culture. And uh, but he was whereas Weber had this sort of acquiescence. Um, he thought this was this the way things were. This was the state of our times. Mm. Uh, just accept this condition of disenchantment. Mm. Your work seems to be looking for. A way of um, of um, uh, going against it, uh, re reversing it, undoing it, or or breaking its spell, as I as I, I somewhat fancifully put it. Yeah, it. that's brilliant. You say individuation is Jung's response to disenchantment. Yeah, the, the, uh, yeah. I mean that that sort of you know when I, I there's a section in the in the in the first chapter of my book called um, breaking the spell of disenchantment individuation as counter magic or something like that mm -hmm. uh, and that's um that's yeah that that's just suggesting that, that the very process that Jung developed of individuation inherently um, undoes all the things that um all the claims that are made for a disenchanted perspective it, aff it affirms um that, that, that there is genuine mystery i mean when you when you're when yeah. you about unknowable archetypes and the, and the you know the the something that the, the unconscious the un inexhaustible unconscious um you're talking about mysteries that can't ever be totally sort of done away with um so that so and, and you and you if you're paying attention to kinds of experiences 
that Jung was paying attention to, such as you know these anomalous and parapsychal paranormal experiences, mystical experiences. I mean, um, he was you know I don't think he for a moment thought that life was was lacking in mystery, and uh, mm-hmm. um, uh, and the uh, yeah and, and individuation also of course um, uh, is is about meaning. I mean, it's about sort of the realization of uh, of of the self ultimately and uh, uh and uh, and one of the ways in which he characterizes the self is as the archetype of meaning and orientation it's about you know creating greater wholeness in your life greater integrity in your life and 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 generating a, a deeper sense of of meaningfulness in 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 your life or, fi- or discovering it and uh, not making it up but actually discovering it um and then the of course, individuation leads to again realization of the self uh, for, for Jung, and uh, the concept of the self. He says is is a um, you know he says it's a concept that is functionally indistinguishable from from the concept of God. So that the image of God and the images of the self for Jung are are sort of functionally indistinguishable, and uh, so his whole psychological project if you like leads to this to, to these um in, in this sort of direction of a of a of a, a sacred reality uh, and uh uh and and he even just you know he even sort of described individuation as being uh i think the, the life in god i think he described it at one point um so so it was a you know profoundly sort of uh uh you know, opposed to the the disenchanted view that there was no uh, no sort of sacred reality or no um, no sort of sacredness in in reality, and uh, and if one looks at Jung's latest work, his maturist account of um, of individuation in Mysterium Conjunctionis, mm. his last large book. Um, mm. I mean, in there he, he 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 sort of culminates it with this discussion of these conjunctions of Gerard Dorn, the, 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 the mystic, and the, and, the, and, the, and the final one is, is this sort of, oh, this, this condition of the mystical union that, that he talks about, which is a sort of, uh, um, you know, the, the sort of realization of one's unity with, with the, the ground of reality. Um, so a very sort of mystical conclusion to his to his understanding of individuation and and profoundly opposed to um to uh to, to the, the the idea of, of disenchantment mm-hmm. and you mentioned the framing of individuation as a process of enchantment disenchantment mm-hmm. and re-enchantment so yeah. what is how do we get re-enchanted well i think i think in jung's understanding not that he was using those terms but uh but uh mm-hmm. where i would look at it based on on his work is that uh he's he, on one level of course he was he was critical of of disenchantment as a um as a sort of a view that thought of itself as providing the way an account of the way things are you know that this is the, the sort of end point on the other hand you know, he, he was not a, at all opposed to um, intellectuality, rationality, right. um, uh, to thinking into all the benefits that come with a, with a sort of a disenchanted uh, uh, vision. You know, the, the, mm-hmm. the increased sure. sort of scientific and technological and economic um, uh, benefits. I mean, he was not at all opposed to that, and and in, even at a psychological level, um, in terms of one's own. A psychological development. Um, he stresses the importance of clear thinking, you know, logical thinking, being able to distinguish things, make differentiation. It's, and it's not all about integration, it's also separation, you know, mm. the separation and synthesis, uh, uh, psychic opposites, he says. So he's, so he's, he's not at all um, sort of rejecting that idea of the importance of what's gone into creating a, a, a disenchanted world. But what is what he is, I think, opposed to is that the story ends there. You yeah. Know, he, he, you know that, that and, uh, and I suppose what I suggest in the 
in the book is that um, that you can actually map the process of um, enchantment, disenchantment, and reenchantment onto Jung's process of individuation. Mm-hmm. So, that, for example, um, if you look at it across the lifespan, the the um, we start off in a in a in a sort of in our you know childhood in an enchanted world where everything yeah. is freely given and and you wish for something and it gets given to you <laughs> and 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 it's a, a sort of a bountiful world you know if if, if you know if you're reasonably lucky um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know this is an enchanted world but then you grow up or you get into young adulthood and you have to sort of encounter the realities. Of, of you know that you need to sort of be able to to uh, relate to and you know, have some sort of um, control over the external world and your internal world and 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 so on. So you need to be you need this sort of rationality and and this distance and um, from, from your experience. You need the disenchantment, if you like, yeah. to get real with the world and to get yourself sort of established and 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 so on. But then later in his, in, in his sort of understanding, um, what, uh, Jung also talks about the need then to sort of reconnect. You know how that that sort of um, that sort of condition that he's talked about can lead to a sense of um, sort of meaninglessness and an emptiness where you right. achieve things in the world, you've got yourself relatively established, but then you you need to to find your find your what your life's really about and what, what how you how it can be made meaningful in a sort of a, a in a, a more than personal way and then that's where probably the sort of the re-enchantment aspect comes more into the frame uh, uh, of that, that sort of sense of reconnecting with the unconscious and and uh, and finding uh mood shifting from a, this this sort of view of the, of reality where where it's more you know, you're you're operating on the world to a more participatory uh, mm. relationship mm-hmm. with the world, and uh, and and and, uh, and ultimately, um, to, uh, you know, to, to a more unitive um, uh, relationship to the world. Um, yeah. in, you know, in, in sort of uh, further stages of of individuation. Um, mm-hmm. so, so I think you can sort of see. Those processes um, all enfolded within the, the process of individuation. But for Jung, the, in a sense, the reenchantment is the more, most important in the sense because it's sort of more the culmination of the whole process of individuation. Yeah, and the and the role of synchronicity uh, in reenchantment you discuss in great detail in the book. Yeah, well, I, I think I mean that's uh, I think that's one of the things that uh, that. Uh, one of the things that Jung was interested in was how synchronicity breaks or helps one to break from that sense of seeing external reality as being separate from one. Um, mm. and other, indeed, and also at a personal level, seeing other people as separate from one, seeing nature as separate from one. Um, uh, how I mean, one of the things he says about synchronicity is that it can help to phrase he uses help, helps to get rid of the incommensurability between the observer and the observed um uh in other words you know it, it you come to feel that what's out there is in, in a sense not entirely separate or not something that's that's so different than something that therefore you can just manipulate and exploit and so on but something that actually is intimately connected to you and that that speaks to you the world um, makes demands upon you nature makes demands upon you Reality makes demands upon you. It's not just something that's sort of impersonal to be exploited and manipulated. Um, so you get this much more participatory feeling coming in with with uh, through the, the experience of synchronicity, and even further, you get this, this you know you get this more sort of uh, you know deeper experience of uh, or intimations at least of. Uh, a more unitive relationship that in fact you know that's it's, you know that's not just a, a participatory relationship it's not just a a, a sort of you know another uh, you know a, a vow in, in a kind of in the way that martin buber would speak of an i vow relationship rather than an i it relationship but even more intimately there's this sense of uh, of mystical realization that you know that, that one could have that uh, that um you know, the, 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 
reality one is reality or reality is 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 one <laughs> it's not there's no yeah. separation it's, you know obviously all these mystical writers will will give us ample sort of eloquent descriptions of that that sort of experience mm -hmm. i think young's work spans that that whole, young's thinking on this area spans that whole um sort of issue yeah it sure does uh, and so switching gears a little bit here, as we begin to wrap up, I happen to notice that you also gave uh, a keynote presentation uh, back in 2021 titled The Importance of Myth for C.G. Jung. Uh, it was for South Africa's Mythos online lecture series. And it got my attention because it's something I've been thinking about a lot about what purpose does myth serve in our culture? I know that's a huge question and we don't have a lot of time, but um, you know, I, I also mentioned in the introduction that you are the director of the Center for Myth Studies. So I thought maybe I would just ask you that huge question and you could give this really concise answer. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I don't, I, I mean, myth for, for you and was obviously with, uh, um, it was a form of, you know, symbolic or archetypal expression, um, and uh, uh, so for Jung, it was a mythic, with a, a sort of an elaborated, a culturally elaborated expression of of, of archetypal meaning. So, so in studying myth, one's mm -hmm. connecting to um, what cultures. Um, historically, traditionally, have have um, perceived about you know these sort of deep archetypal realities and so on, and have en encoded in story. So you're sort of connecting with that. So I, th I suppose um, just being con remaining connected with that, I think, is is a, is a valuable thing in itself. You know, to remain connected to myth um, and. Of course, myth is is not something that is finished. I mean, it was ne it was never mm -hmm. finished. I mean, in, in you know, in, in in let's take Greek mythology. You know, there there were in, in at the time there was no definitive version of the myths. There were numerous variants and and so on. And nobody seemed to have any great trouble with that. They didn't fight yeah. over who was correct, correct or whatever. Mm -hmm. it, was, it seemed to be understood that it was a a way of thinking rather than a, a sort of a dogma mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, so, um, so it's it's still sort of alive, and uh, and there are there are you know experiences happen which, in a sense, could be generating new myths, um, uh, and and that, and that doesn't a myth doesn't mean something that's necessarily untrue. Um, quite the contrary, it's a sort of a, a an expression, mm. a symbolic expression of something that can't necessarily express itself. In any other way, better. Yeah. Um, so you get. I mean, you mentioned um, you mentioned Whitley Strieber earlier, and some of the experiences that he writes about um, are, you know, I mean, this is the stuff that, that myths are made of. I mean, it's it really extraordinary sort of experiences, um, uh, you know, that that he narrates into some form of, of story, um, and uh, you know, and and. You know these these are um, you know I, you know what's what's actually going on in them is is you know open for exploration and uh, he 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 seem, doesn't seem to necessarily be definitive about it himself right he, he's, he changes his views doesn't he and uh, and explores it he remains open minded to, to it and yeah. uh, um, you know but but these are experiences that that happen. And uh, and they uh, you know they get recorded they get storied and 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 they're there as as things that are sort of in some way connecting us to to aspects of our our you know our possible human experience that that probably have some you know some some importance some great importance and going back to that word mystery uh, that really got my attention because when I started analysis I mean I was. A scientist. I was trained in science and worked in science. And my analysts would talk about getting comfortable with mystery. And that made me furious. I, I don't, I want to know, 
I want to get to the bottom of this and I want answers. Mm -hmm. And I've, I think I'm, I mean, I'm getting there making peace with the fact that by the time I die, I'm not going to have the answers I thought I had. Mm -hmm. So embracing the unknown and, and, and the mystery of it all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I do want to mention another book uh, that was published last year in 2022 by Routledge. You wrote the introduction and the commentary for, no, you didn't, for the interpretation of nature and the psyche. I, th I don't know what's happened there. That, that's not been oh. done yet. That well, that's not been done yet. This is published. This is a uh, publishers uh, getting ahead of themselves, I'm afraid. Okay. Yeah, I've, not, I've not finished that yet. Okay, so it will be published uh, maybe oh, this it, year. It, uh, it won't be published this year. No, I don't think it will be published. No. This year. Okay. No, there's the uh, um, that's still that's still very much a work in progress. Okay, um, then I will I'll, I will let Routledge. Okay, I'll let Routledge know that on their website uh, it's yeah. for sale and it says it was published in 2022. Okay, well, yeah. okay, well that's. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but it's, no, uh, no, that's okay. But uh, just for the listeners, uh, because this book gets mentioned on this podcast quite, quite often. Oh. Uh, it is the interpretation of nature and the psyche, the work of Carl Jung and Wolfgang Pauli. And it was originally published in 1955. And it is in the process of being republished. You're the editor. And it's, it's two papers. It's two essays. One is Jung Jung's essay on synchronicity, and the other is Pauli's The Influence of Archetypal Ideas on the Scientific Theories of Kepler. Mm -hmm. And so we will look forward to that. I will uh, let the listeners know when a publication date is announced, and we'll look forward to it. Uh, and as I mentioned, this summer, uh, June 2023, you will be presenting the hermeneutics of exceptional experiences at the Perry Center Conference. I don't know if would you like to say a little bit about that? Uh, well, I, I, I would, uh, I mean, if people want to know about it, have a look at the, the Perry uh, Center webpage. Yes, I will I provide a link to that in the show notes uh, for this episode at speakingofyoung.com. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a great sort of conference uh, where you, a week long, and the, the speakers, or some other, there's some so some great speakers in, involved in it, and uh, uh, looking at sort of ed, it's called edges of consciousness, I think, isn't it, um, uh, or something like that. And uh, yes, at the um, edges of consciousness, science and anomalous experiences. Yeah, so it's sort of investigating that, and the um, yeah the. Uh, pe it's a sort of a week-long thing, residential. Um, so it takes place in this lovely uh, little Italian village up on a, a hilltop. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, very relaxed and, and sort of intimate sort of gathering and, and lots of time to discuss the ideas and so on. So it's, uh, and you, you've done other things for the Perry Center before. You've spoken at their conferences and, and their online events as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, there. It's a very, it's a very nice organization. They yes, and stuff. Yeah, it sure is. So in the show notes uh, for this episode at speakingofyoung.com, I will have links to a lot of your papers. I found are available online through Google Scholar. I went through everything, oh. and for the ones where the full text is available, I've. Uh, made a list of them uh, with links uh, so that people can download those. I will also include, of, of course, all the links to your books. And uh, I'm just looking through my notes. I don't know if there's anything else you want to mention that we haven't covered. That's fine. No, this, uh, this is this endless stuff one could talk about, but uh, yeah, there sure is. I just, if there's anything that I didn't mention that you would like to say uh, before we close. No, that's fine. Nope. Okay, great. I just uh, I mean to thank you for for having me on and uh, oh, thank you for, for you know enjoyable conversation. So thank you. I appreciate your time. So I'm going to read the outro. Would you stay with me? Great. Okay. So please visit our website, speakingofyoung.com, for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. 
There you'll also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download commercial free. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Music. So with special thanks to Dr. Murray Stein, ISAP Zurich, and to Chiron Publications, I'm Laura London, and you've been watching a very special video edition of Speaking of Young.